Hey guys, welcome. Welcome to Collective Campus for our first episode of Future Squared Live. Um, can I maybe get a show of hands who actually listens to the podcast? We've got a few in the audience. We've actually got about 1,800 listeners a day at the moment, so we're climbing the ranks on iTunes, um, bouncing anywhere between top 20 to top 50 um, since launching six months ago. So it's been a pretty fun journey so far. I interviewed guys like Steve Blank, um, Jake Knapp from Google Ventures. Um, we've got Alex Osterwalder on there soon. Interviewed uh, Pascal Finette from Singularity University the other day, David Allen, and it's a pleasure to have Ash Moria um, here today as well. Um, so if we're going to have a first live show and a first live guest, what better guest to have? So without further ado, as I like to say on the podcast, um, hailing from Austin, Texas, Ash Moria is the founder of LeanStack. Since bootstrapping his last company seven years ago, he has launched five products and one peer web application framework. Throughout his time, he's been in search of better, faster ways for building successful products. Ash has more recently been rigorously applying customer development and lean startup techniques to his products, frequently writing about this on his blog, ashmoria.com, and turning this into the critically acclaimed book, Running Lean, How to Iterate from Plan A to a Plan That Works. Ash is also the creator of the one-page business modeling tool that I happen to absolutely love, the Lean Canvas, which is used by startups and corporate innovators across the globe. His new book, Scaling Lean, Master the Key Metrics for Startup Growth, debuted at number two on the Wall Street Journal business bestseller list. Um, and it basically explores an invaluable blueprint for modeling startup success and ultimately scale a business by implementing a 10x rollout strategy. Um, Ash is also a leading business blogger and his posts and advice have been featured in Inc. Magazine, Forbes, and Fortune Magazine. He regularly hosts sold out workshops. He hosted a two day workshop. Well, he's in the middle of a two day workshop in Melbourne. Um, today is the conclusion of day one. So I hope it's not too tired for us tonight. Um, and we had about 30 people in here today. So another sold out workshop. Um, and he's also mentored to several accelerators, including Textiles, Mars, Capital Factory, and guest lectures, lectures at several universities, including MIT, Harvard, and UT Austin. Um, so with that, it gives me much pleasure to bring to you Ash Moria. Pleasure to be on. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on, on the show, Ash. Um, so you've been bouncing back and forth. I understand you are in Sydney a few weeks ago. Uh -huh. uh, you like to do things a week at a time, I understand? Yes. So I, I, I have this um, working constraint that I put upon myself. Mm -hmm. So I, I uh, from the start, did not want to be on the road all the time, but knew I had to travel some. So I made a, mm -hmm. a, a plan where I would travel once a month, a week at a time. But the world was my oyster. So I could go anywhere, but for a week at a time. And so I got the first thing I did is I got wife and family approved. So mm -hmm. wife and kids signed up on that. Yeah. Always important. Uh, but it really for me is the right balance because I I do a lot of maker stuff. As you know, I write, mm -hmm. I create content, and it's very hard to do that when you're on the road. You just get all distracted. So it's a way for me to go out and be an extrovert for a week, and then I go back and to mm -hmm. my introvert self and for the next three weeks. Okay, fantastic. Um, <laughs> And we've got a few Texans in the crowd tonight, I believe, from Houston and a few other places. How are you guys adjusting? Well, how are you adjusting to the, to the weather here, coming from 110 <laughs> degrees Fahrenheit? It's not quite that bad, but um, but yeah, but I, I, I think it's always you know better weather is good, but I'll take yeah. anything. So so when I did when I did land in here, the sun was shining up on the Monday, so it was, brought it was. some of the sun with me. Brought some of it, fantastic. Didn't, didn't really last too long. <laughs> Um, so Ash, your first book, Running Lean, was all about helping startups uh, adopt a lean development methodology to help them fail fast, um, run experiments, and increase their likelihood of success. Um, for those in the audience who aren't familiar with your product, can you perhaps give them the 30-second elevator pitch? For Running Lean? For Running Lean. Yeah, so the big epiphany, so I, I'm a product guy. I, I build. Um, I, I knew how to build products very well, and one of the big epiphanies in Running Lean was realizing that when we go into product development, we think of our solution as being the most important thing, mm -hmm. but it's really the business model. So that was the core message to get out. And then the rest of the book talked about how you can model your business model using this tool called the Lean Canvas. Um, how do you get outside the building and talk to customers and figure out what they want without asking them directly? Because to code Steve Jobs, customers don't really know what they want. Mm -hmm. and a lot of these techniques, for doing problem interviews, solution interviews, and extracting 
what customers really want and need, and then building those things using a lot of the lean yeah. techniques. Fantastic. And would you, given that you run so many workshops across the globe, um, would you say that's kind of an epiphany for the majority of people that attend your workshops? Yeah, I was surprised by that. I thought I was just me doing things the wrong way all these, <laughs> all these years, you know, falling in love with my solution, not the problem or yeah. the business model. Yeah. But as I began to share this, I got tons of people nodding their heads and saying, you know, we've been there, we did the exact same thing. And that's when I, all the pattern matching happened. I began to see that entrepreneurs are everywhere, mm -hmm. all across the globe. Mm -hmm. uh, we all, we may speak different languages, but we all want the same things, fear the same things, and tend to make the same types of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so that was what also inspired me to do more of these crazy one week trips and yeah. just go to more places. Fantastic. And essentially, we're having a chat earlier. You're talking about how uh, Boot Startup is essentially a mission driven organization. That's why you know, yeah. doing a lot of this stuff, helping spread the message. So not as many individuals and companies go out and just blow a lot of money on this first grand idea that they had. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So that, that was kind of that big spark is seeing that there is entrepreneurship. And if I were to say what that impact is, what I'm driven by is really helping create more entrepreneurs, but better entrepreneurs mm. in the next 10 years and ideally not have everyone just decide they want to move to Silicon Valley. So yeah. that's not to me the right solution. Mm -hmm. um, it's rather creating um, not your own Silicon Valleys, but your own versions of the ecosystem that works in local communities and keep keep the knowledge there and keep the communities there and, and kind of innovate in your own yeah. way. And I think that's a great point. I think a lot of cities around the world are trying to just copy <laughs> what Silicon Valley does, but you can't really right. mimic the entire environment. Um, so your second book, um, as I mentioned, it's debuted at number two on the Wall Street Journal business bestsellers list. Um, it picks up where Running Lean left off. So what can readers expect to learn from Scaling Lean that they wouldn't learn in Running Lean? Sure. So both books are very entrepreneur centric. So they're focused on the entrepreneur as being the protagonist in both stories. Mm -hmm. And the first book, Running Lean, was really about the entrepreneur to customer conversation. So how do you get outside the building and understand, as I said, what customers want without just going out and directly asking them? So all those techniques for doing it. What I found is that since the first book, tons of people were inspired to go out and they got all this learning. Mm -hmm. They came back to their stakeholders and said, look at all the stuff we have learned. Look at these minimum viable products we have built. Look at the small customer bases we have, we have got for validation. But the stakeholders said that I don't get it. It's still too small. I don't mm -hmm. see the big rainbow at the end. Sure. You know, so they, we are we are used to measuring, especially in corporates, we're mm -hmm. used to measuring um, success by old metrics. So we want to see revenue, and we use the same metrics which don't apply in early stage stuff. Yes. So the second book is all about the conversation between that innovator, that entrepreneur, and their stakeholders. So how do you come back and not talk about traditional metrics, but rather innovation metrics, mm -hmm. and how do you use leading indicators and kind of communicate all that. So that's what the second book primarily is about. So I guess you're alluding to their metrics like internal rate of return, net present value, yep. um, and if that's what you're hanging your hat on, chances are in 99% of cases, you won't see those metrics in the first two, three, four years maybe. If, even worse, they're gonna be negative, like yeah. growth you know, on the on the red, and yeah, you're not gonna see them, and so yeah, that, that creates a lot of concern and um, and so yeah, so how do you you know put the right metrics in place mm -hmm. of that? Um, so that's that's absolutely the Excellent. point. I can see how that would support conversations with in large organizations between product development and uh, say finance. Um, I mean, what kind of metrics would people be looking at instead of those traditional metrics? Yeah, so I, I'm a big fan of Dave McClure's Pirate Metrics. Yeah. So that's the the five metrics there being acquisition, activation, retention, revenue, referral. I find that a lot of people look at it from a marketing lens and look at it as a marketing funnel. But in the book, I start to look at it more from a, as a as a kind of a different representation. So it's more of a system view to mm -hmm. how you might look at those metrics and how they interrelate. Mm -hmm. So it's those basic five metrics, but the the way that you kind of visualize it, the way that you use them, are it's a different presentation. And I think it has had a very different impact when we have gone uh, to both startups and corporates and showed those that way of using mm -hmm. the metrics. Yeah. So I guess for our audience, in terms of the practical application of those metrics, would that be acquisition as in getting a click through to your website, activation as in a sign up on your website or? Yeah, yeah, those would be, those would be good comparables. If you had, if you had an online product, acquisition would essentially be measuring the point from where you've got 
a visitor to your site to where they become interested. Mm -hmm. So it's really them spending time or them identifying themselves as I'm interested in your product. Um, activation would be the first, uh, the first experience. So this would be where you test your initial value proposition. Ideally, you deliver as much of it as possible mm -hmm. and get people to say, this is where I want to be. And if you can activate people, they come back and are retained. So they use your product more. And that's when you can begin to monetize. So I look at a business model as doing three things. You have to be able to create value. You have mm -hmm. to be able to deliver value and then capture some of that value back. So yeah. if you can, if you can, uh, yeah. so you, so we use the activation step to, to create, deliver value. And then the capturing of the value is the revenue. And if you create enough happy customers, they then refer your product. So that would yeah. be the, the feedback loop from, from your customers. Makes perfect sense. And, um, on corporate uh, metrics and approaches to innovation, I know you've been doing uh, a bit of work uh, coaching corporates in this space. So I, I'm sure there's quite a few people here and those who will listen online um, who work for large organizations and getting their organizations to adopt something like Lean Canvas for starters yep. um, can be a challenge. So keen to hear how you've managed to influence people um, in, in organizations to actually see things a bit differently. Yeah, it's, in some ways I've, I've been pleasantly surprised. They have actually influenced themselves. So, oh, that's, and, and makes what your I, job easier. <laughs> it makes my job easier. So I'm, I, I'm surprised, and when I say I'm surprised is that we actually have an online app, and so we, we know everyone who's using that app. Mm -hmm. But I go into big organizations and I find that they're using the Lean Canvas off the radar. So we, can't, we don't even know they're using right. it because they are concerned about privacy, security, and so they just you know, create a version of that. But when we have gone and talked to them, the thing that I find, uh, one of the reasons that I think the Lean Canvas has been adopted is it's really a business modeling tool disguised as a maker tool. Mm -hmm. And it's very reflective because I was an entrepreneur. Um, when I looked at the original business model canvas, which some of you might have been exposed to, it was a very kind of strategic view on the business model. Mm -hmm. And I felt that there were many things that were you know, too business oriented and they were too ladder stage, like mm -hmm. scaling. And so for me, it was trying to create something that was more approachable. So I was, the fundamental thing is, who are you trying to serve? So who are your customers? What problems do they have? And what solution do you put to solve those problems? Yeah. And just that is the foundation of the Lean Canvas and everything else kind of builds on top of that. Um, so I think because of that, you find a lot of makers, a lot of product owners kind of adopting the Lean Canvas and mm. using it as a tool, even just for release planning, but it becomes becomes adopted that yeah. way. Yeah, and that essentially then addresses what you call out in your book, the three main risks, customer, product, and market risk, yeah. um, by focusing on problem solution as opposed to all that latter stage business model stuff. Yes, yeah. that's right. Fantastic. Um, and on corporates, I mean, there is a, a lot of criticism from people with, I suppose, traditional mindsets um, in companies who say that using approaches like running lean or the lean startup, um, that all we're doing is releasing half-baked uh, solutions to poorly identified problems to market. Um, how do you respond to criticisms like that? And so half-baked because they're, I mean, maybe yeah, half-baked as in they're the not MVP fully concept. functional, the yeah. MVPs, they don't have all the bells and whistles. Yeah. So, so I guess on that, I, I often, you know, use some counter examples. So I'll use some very, so oftentimes there's this kind of myth that the MVP has to be a, a cheap and fast product. Mm. And for me, it's not about being cheap and fast, but cheaper and faster than the alternative. Yeah. And so if we look at products like the iPhone, I would almost say the iPhone one was an MVP. It had mm. lots of missing features. It was the butt of a lot of jokes. It didn't have basic copy and paste. Could, you couldn't multitask between apps they still were named innovation of the year mm. because they were trying to solve one problem, which is take three devices, a music player, a phone, an internet device, put it into one. And I can see Steve Jobs running around like a maniac saying, as long as we can deliver on that, everything else is, is icing on the cake, yeah. right? So it's that focus that is what the MVP is about. So it's not about kind of building an incomplete or a half finished product. Um, another big example kind of from, the, from, from recent would be Tesla. So when Tesla was building their first uh, car, they realized that what they were really trying to solve was range anxiety. Mm. And the way you do it is not by building a car, but rather building a battery. So instead of the traditional route of going and hiring automotive engineers, factories and all that stuff and building a car, they just went and licensed a car from Lotus, mm. took out its guts, put their battery in there and sold that as an MVP. Yeah. So that was also a minimum viable product. Yeah. 
Yeah, makes perfect sense. Um, and on, I mean, we touched a little bit on metrics. And one thing that a lot of entrepreneurs uh, struggle with, and even in corporate environments, it is the question of how much data is enough. At what point do we say this experiment um, or this assumption is valid or invalid? Um, is there a risk that we're pulling the plug early or we're waiting too long? And how do you balance that? Yeah, so I, I so that's where I, I like the, the clarity of the five metrics in mm. the in the in the in the R metrics uh, kind of model. Um, we have actually the world has changed. We've actually gone from a point where it was hard to measure stuff to where we're in the other extreme, where you can measure almost anything. And so as a result of that, we don't get, I find we don't get more clarity. We actually just give ourselves permission to drown in a lot of, mm -hmm. in a sea of data and just get more lost. Yeah. And so I look at, there's a, there's, a, there's a place for secondary metrics and that's one of the key messages in the book is that you do want to track a lot of things, but you don't have to really look at them. You want to first identify what are the, the which is the, the key constraint or the key metric you want to move. Mm and how do you kind of just visualize that one. So when you're designing an experiment, typically think about which one of those five metrics you want to change. Is it acquisition, activation, retention? Yeah. And how does that connect up to the overall you know, throughput of the business? Yeah. Yeah. Is that really working? And when the experiment you know, doesn't give you the lift that you're looking for, that's where the secondary metrics come in. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about how much data, it's going to be a function of you know, just what happens with that experiment, how, mm. how deep you have to dig in. Yeah, makes sense. And um, you mentioned there, you know, you focus on either acquisition or activation, where where you are in the funnel. Um, one of my previous guests was uh, Ben Yoskovitz, who wrote Lean Analytics, yep. so the one metric that matters. I uh, imagine you're an advocate for that approach, focusing on your one key metric? Yes, with, with a caveat. So one of the things that I found is that you can sometimes get lost um, just focusing on one metric. Mm -hmm. And so like to give you an extreme example of this, if we go into what I call the curse of specialization, as a company grows, we go to our salespeople and say, your one metric that matters is closing sales. That's all I want you to do. And I'll even incentivize you. I'll give you commissions if you do that. Mm -hmm. um, magically, sales close at the end of the month. Um, and when you kind of study that, behavior, you begin to see that the people who close at the end of the month may be not as happy about the, the, the closing as the ones who close earlier in the month. And you can see that in the churn rate. So they actually cancel more often than people who close earlier mm -hmm. because they were under time pressure. They were kind of forced into an aggressive sales environment. They said yes, but they didn't mean to say yes. So all those things begin to happen. Mm -hmm. So that's when I say, you know, when you focus just on that one metric, you forget to see that, and that's where the systems thinking in the second book comes into play, is that you start to optimize for a local metric, a local KPI, but you fail to really affect the overall throughput of the system. Sure. So for me, it's great to have that clarity to say acquisition or activation is the thing that is currently the constraint. But when you design an experiment to fix that, you have to make sure that it has follow on effect. You're not creating this this illusion of increasing lift mm -hmm. in one and then at the expense of, uh, of, ex of, a, of something else. Yeah. Another like extreme example of this, and this actually comes from Eric Reese's previous company, IM View. Um, they actually did the same thing as they scaled. They began to design the, the, the team structure into different, into the five metrics and they incentivize everyone. So the retention team got so good at retaining people that they actually forgot to buy the product. Right. It's like, you know, we're having all this stuff for, for free why should we buy the product? Mm. So when you're doing things like that, then you know that the, the one metric focus may be not yeah. the best thing. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And when you look at that at a high level in many large companies, um, they're focused on their short-term metrics and satisfying yep. shareholders and paying out dividends, but at the same time, that comes at the cost of you know, innovation. Yep. And five years yep. down the track, they're being disrupted by smaller upstarts. Um, makes, makes perfect sense. Um, and on large companies who may be a little bit wary of, of experimenting um, because it may cause, say, reputational damage um, to their brands, um, how should such companies approach experimentation? I mean, if I'm a large financial institution or a healthcare company and I've got, you know, multi-billion dollar market cap and shareholders and multiple stakeholders, how do I manage that? Yes, there, there are a number of tactics. So one of the most commonly used one is really just simply going off brand. So mm -hmm. you go off brand and you can pr preserve the brand. Um, even if you were staying on brand, you have to realize that not all customers are created equal. Yeah. Um, there are going to be segments of your customers that are not maybe even your tier one customers, but your tier two or tier three. 
that are willing to get into a mode, they'll get on your advisory board, they'll be willing to take things that are you know, somewhat experimental, mm -hmm. um, somewhat early, because they want that competitive advantage of getting access to things that help them faster. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's fundamentally about creating a partnership with your customers. Yeah. We always look at, you know, I'm gonna build this perfect product and then sell it to my customers. But if you actually go into this co-creation environment and you say, I'm here to help you, the customer, and let's work on kind of this collaboratively, it's it's amazing what you can do. Mm -hmm. So it's, to me, you know, that often is a is a is a concern that I see a lot of people raise. We cannot hurt brand, we cannot hurt revenue, we cannot hurt our reputation. But there are lots of tactical solutions to to get around that. Yeah, yeah. Um, that makes uh, a lot of sense. Um, and I think Intuit Labs um, are a great model uh, of company that does that. I think they have a partnership with a segment of their customers and they release beta products yeah. under the Intuit Labs brand and therefore they're able to get feedback from actual customers. Um, and it's different to focus groups, right? Because from what I understand, a lot of focus groups, people are one, paid to be there, two, asked if they would use a product, but not really asked to pay for the product. Um, what's your view yeah. on focus groups versus the t type of customer testing that you um, advocate? Yeah, so, so there's definitely that problem, which is, yeah, people are paid to be there, but the more important thing is that you kind of get into this group think mindset. Yeah. So, you know, we've got an audience here. If we start focus grouping things, there'll be a few vocal people that will start to steer the conversation. And pretty soon everyone seems to agree, but that's not necessarily what they may be mm. thinking. Mm. So it's counterintuitive, but by almost doing the opposite, which is talking to every one of you individually, I can get to more insights about um, about what will work and what will not work faster than doing it as a group. Mm. And it's a counterintuitive reality as there are, in Lean there are many, many such uh, counterintuitive realities, which is in some ways also the Achilles heel of the methodology. Too many yeah. people don't think that that should be what they should be doing. Yeah. Um, I take it then you'd be a fan of the whole working um, alone together approach. Um, for example, if you're in a workshop setting and rather than one person saying, I think this is a good idea and everyone else kind of echoes his thoughts, if everyone silently writes their ideas down and then uh, yeah. brings them together, you're gonna get way more ideas. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there, there are lots of these techniques and even in the from this, so I, I uh, in, the, in the next book, there's this concept of a lean sprint and we use a lot of these techniques and some of them are inspired from agile sprints, scrum sprints, design sprints, even the Google ventures kind of put together. Mm -hmm. And one of the techniques there is the note and vote. So rather than yeah, asking, I have this problem, what are solutions and have people just vocalize them, you have them write them down and then kind of shortlist them, put them on, you know, put a timer and have them shout out the ideas and you get a lot more independent thinking that way yeah. than doing group stuff. Yeah. Even, with the lean, even with the Lean Canvas exercise, I actually find it is faster to get a team to go and individually take a stab at the canvas and then go to a poster and put all their post-it notes and then you begin to see where the overlaps are than having them do it as a team. It, again, seems like it would make more sense to brainstorm and, and create that together, mm. but you get into so many debates that it takes you know, three times as yeah. long. And how important is it to defer judgment um, of the different ideas of that part of the process. Oh, absolutely. So, and I think it was an Einstein quote, and again, maybe not attributed, to, misattributed to him, I don't know, but mm -hmm. he talked about the, this idea of diversity of ideas being the most important thing. Yeah. Um, and I see that even in, in the world we live in. So I, I talk a lot about the innovator's bias for the solution. That manifests its ugly head in many ways. So in the beginning, we fall in love with the solution, but later on, when you are even at a team that is specialized, if I present a problem to you, I say I've got a low activation rate problem and you're a designer, you pretty much will come up with a UX solution. That's not what I've observed. Mm. Um, your developers will come up with building more things um, or making things faster and your marketers will come up with some marketing solution. Yeah. So again, nothing wrong with that by itself, but the key is you want to get to a point where you present a problem, don't bias people with a solution, get a lot of independent thinking and then you find fast and effective ways to test those ideas mm -hmm. and double down on the ones that actually you know, show you results. Yeah. And uh, touched on a good point there with uh, designers, developers, marketers, um, in some cases perhaps all thinking that it's their, st their work that's you know, turning the dial on the metrics and how important, are, is it, how important is it that those metrics are accessible and auditable um, so you don't have oh, marketing saying, oh, it was, <laughs> it was our marketing campaign, oh, yeah. dev saying it was that feature we released. 
Yeah, yeah. so I, I have a quote in the second book too. It's a, a rising tide raises all ships. And mm -hmm. so what I mean by that is that when the numbers are good, everyone takes credit for it. Yeah. But a falling tide raises all fingers, right? So then it's 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 no longer my problem; it's the other person's problem because you know nothing's really changed. We're still doing the same thing we did last month. Yeah. And so I absolutely like bringing in this this perception of making the metrics be very visible, but as you've said, auditable and and trackable are mm -hmm. are just so so critical. Yeah. And even just asking those fundamental first principle questions. If a designer came to me and said, "I'm going to create a better design, and aesthetically it looks better." Um, you still have to test that it has that lift in the metric you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And we have actually done things where a design looks better visually, but it was the copy that was really converting. Mm -hmm. And so when you put the same design in there, there was no lift in conversion. So we just spent time to create a better looking version of the same thing, mm -hmm. which you can say it was fine because it didn't take us that long. But when you do do things where you're putting kind of lipstick on something that's already working, it doesn't really help, help yeah. you all that much. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. Um, and a couple more questions I had just on one on regulated companies. Um, a lot of listeners of this show are from incredibly regulated companies, health insurers, financial services, um, superannuation, um, what you guys call 401k. Yeah. Um, how can you effectively experiment um, when you've got the watchdogs looking down on you? Yeah. So there are some great case studies. There's a company that was, that was used to be called Kaching. Now they're Wealthfront. They work in the SEC regulated market. So they've got you know a story of how they kind of continuously deploy code. And you have to just take more measures. But they got all of that um, kind of approved. So sometimes it's more work. But it's at the, the thing to remember is that in a lean in a lean startup environment, speed is the advantage. Mm -hmm. And so if you can outlearn your competition, you win. And sometimes that requires you to do more work up front. Um, but also at the same time, you know, when we talk about medical devices and things, you know, we don't want to be experimenting on, on, on patients. Um, but what I find is that you have to go, if food is the same type of thing, you have to go through all the safety um, kind of standards if you're building a car, same type of things. Mm -hmm. But we have time and time again see that those are not the riskiest things in the business. Yeah. The riskiest things are really around the switching behavior. So people are currently driving is a non-electric car. Will they switch to an electric car? Mm -hmm. What are the obstacles? Can you test for that? Um, similarly, on the medical devices uh, side, um, I had this one story from a, a team that was building a, a dental compound that could uh, help reduce cavities in babies. Um, and they thought all along, you know, once we build this stuff, we'll go to dentists and they will just sell this like hotcakes. Um, once the product was actually built, they approached a few dentists and the dentist just said, why would I sell this? It reduces my billable work. You know, if I, the no cavities means people don't come to me. So like, thanks, but no thanks. That could have been tested day one. You didn't have to wait four years, which is what this, this team did. Um, they were just perfecting and getting all the, the, the clinical trials and all of that stuff. And then when they went to roll it out, they realized that that was not going to be a channel they could use. They had to probably go the retail route, which has lost them a lot of time. Yeah. So again, when you when you start with what's risky, is it may not be the the regulated industry. There are other risk, customer risk, market risk, adoption risk yeah. that you tackle before those things. Yeah, um, and that comes back to the lean canvas, validating your problem, your solution, customer segments, and so on. And I think GE is a great case study of a company who's applied this approach. Um, I think in their industrial division, um, they've applied it to traditional uh, industrial circuit breakers, and I think half the uh, cost or the time to market for circuit breakers and they're using it on medical devices and everything else. So can be done in regulated industries and big bureaucratic organizations. Absolutely. Fantastic. And now finally, I'm, I'm a massive advocate of flow and getting into <laughs> flow. And I know in your book, you talk about both getting into flow as a startup and getting into flow as an individual. Um, so how do you get into <laughs> flow, Ash? Yeah, so I'll first talk about what triggered that. So, sure. so again, there's always a, a trigger I find for these types of kind of behavior changes. So I was not one that was very efficient with my time before, mm -hmm. but then I had kid number one and then I had kid number two, all while I was building uh, a startup and kind of in the mid midst of it. And so I began to realize that I could negotiate with my spouse. You can always negotiate for more time, but you can't, <laughs> but you can't negotiate with a crying baby. So if it's your turn to take care of the baby, you know, you've got to go do it. And so that forced me to kind of appreciate free time. Mm -hmm. And I began to view time as a scarcest resource. And so that's when I began to say, how can I get into flow? I can get in and out of it very quickly. And so there are a number of work hacks that I began to build. 
one of them was realizing that to be able to do maker time, uh, to be able to do maker work, you need unter uninterrupted blocks of time. So when is the best time to do it? For some people, it's late at night. Other people, it's early in the morning. Um, I realized that early in the morning was good because that was also when you know, our kids were sleeping through and they were still kind of asleep then. So I would, even though I was not a morning person, would wake up and just have these blocks, two hour blocks, three hour blocks of uninterrupted time where I would write, you know, write the book or write code or do things like that and not have any distractions. So I'll email everything mm -hmm. off. Um, don't even look at it. So just wake up and just get to work and you just have that beginner's fresh mind and you can just quickly jump into, at least for me, get into flow. Yeah. Um, and so that was also my personality. I tend to be very accomplishment driven. If I have a day where I feel like I haven't pushed something forward, um, it's not a good day for me. I just don't feel like it was well done. So for me, doing that heavy lifting up front allows me to then spend the rest of the day for more managerial types of things. So that's mm -hmm. when you're interrupt driven, when you have to go talk to customers or fight fires or talk to your team or mm -hmm. tend to a crying baby and you know, all of those yeah. types of things. So, <laughs> yeah, and I guess there's lots of different hacks people can apply. Um, I think Tim Ferriss is a massive advocate of checking his email, I believe, twice a day. <laughs> um, because once you check your email, you just start chasing little fairy so rabbits down the rabbit yeah. hole. Right? So, um, okay, we are down to the lightning round. Are you ready, Ash? Sure. Fantastic. Okay, question number one. If you could work for any company at any stage of the company lifecycle, who would it be and why? It would probably be for one of Elon Musk's companies, just because yeah. I want to understand um, just how good of a strategist he really is and how many hours he actually does work to, to do all the things he does. <laughs> yeah. Love it, love it. Uh, question number two out of three is, if you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? Hmm. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I tend to be very kind of goal-driven. So, um, yeah, that's a tough one. I, I probably would say it would, it would probably be, be Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. and I would probably, you know, ask him about, um, I guess, just just to how uh, you know how how he connected the dots between a lot of the products that he built. Yeah. So there's all these conspiracy theories of, you know, starting with, you know, having the vision all thought out. Was it really, you know, connecting all the dots up front, or was it really a discovery process? Because we always look at Apple as the anti-lean example mm. and i have a theory that you know, a lot of it is still kind of discovery on the fly is just they can they, they do things um, kind of in a different way and call it different things but they mm. still do a lot of customer learning just not yeah. the same way that we advocate for yeah them. and i guess steve jobs uh, famously said you know, he connected the dots looking back right yeah, yeah. so the stanford calligraphy class his zen buddhism right um dropping in at xerox's um research center and stealing their GUI. All that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and the last question was around how do you stay on top of your game, Ash? Do you have any rituals or routines? So one of them I talked about it's just it's it's getting the you know getting the the most important thing done early in the day. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is I'm a ardent unit tasker. I don't believe in multitasking. Mm -hmm. And so even though on the outside it looks like I'm doing all kinds of things, you know, I run workshops, I write books, we build software products. Um, it's all a juggling illusion. So it seems like we're juggling three balls in the air, but there's only one ball really up in the air. The other two are, it's like a real juggler planted in your hand. And it's a very additive process. So I look at the workshops as feeding into the learning, which then goes into um, the writing, which may then go into the products. So everything kind of connects yeah. together well. Yeah. yeah. And I guess there's a lesson there for companies who are just trying to do too many different things. It's hard enough to find product market fit for one right. idea, let alone five at the same time. Right, absolutely. Uh, fantastic. Um, well, thank you so much, Ash. Uh, you've been an amazing guest. Of course, people can find out a little bit more about you at ashmoria.com and as well uh, on Twitter, ashmoria, uh, linkstack.com as well. Just Google him. You'll find a ton of resources. Um, but with that, let's uh, open it up to the floor. I hope I didn't take all the, all the yeah. questions. <laughs> question. yeah. uh, you were saying um, for the product uh, product that changes people's behavior, it's hard to test for. So like, how would you test the, the dental thing? I mean, that could be test up, tested up front, but if you create a product that, that needs to change the way people do things, mm -hmm. how do you test that process as being the riskiest assumption? 
Yeah, so in, in some ways, it's, it's really just going through the motions of those five metrics. So one of the first things you have to get over is acquisition. And to be able to acquire someone, to get them interested even in the product, um, I find it's even before even like thinking about the minimum viable product and what you're actually going to go build, you start with an offer. So you go out there and you, you give them a promise, um, you give them a demo, and you talk about what is that currency of exchange. It could be the pricing model, it could be some other metric that you're tracking. And you try to see, you know, do they start moving in that direction? So if I look at Tesla, I brought that up early on, there was a behavior change there. You're going from a gas powered vehicle, petrol powered vehicle to electric, that's a behavior change. So if Tesla went out there and said, we're building an all affordable electric car, um, you know, do people sign up on the list? That may be the first thing that you go and test. Do people say, I would like to be notified when you have more information? Um, and that could be the very first experiment you run. So, and if no one really cares, then you try to figure out the value proposition. Um, you have to tweak it because maybe that's not the thing that gets people excited, but what is it? So you have to solve that problem first. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll stand up just because I was a speaker. Um, so a bit of background, I work for a company called Mass Challenge. They have the largest stuff accelerator in the world. Um, and to give a bit of a question, it's because I'm asking on behalf of our staff. So uh, entire accelerator is sponsored. So it's you know, given money by the biggest brands in the world. So it doesn't cost the startups anything. Um, we've just moved to Australia. In learning what those metrics are, the big companies have to uh, you know, change or shift in thinking more about startup mentality in Australia. What are the ones that they look to first when trying to understand the value of startups? And how can you best coach them? Best coach the companies or the, the startups, startups and the large companies to understand each other's value. Yeah, so I would say that the, the metric that ultimately matters is the traction metric, and traction is poorly misunderstood. We use it for all kinds of things, like how much money we have in the bank or how big our team is, but those are not the right traction metrics. So going at it from a business modeling perspective, you need to be able to communicate a business model story and talk about the way I define traction is the rate at which you can capture monetizable value from your business. So if you can go to a corporate and demonstrate that this number is going up and to the right and not on an aggregate basis, but month over month, um, I don't care if it's a corporate an investor, they're just gonna sit you down and want to understand your business better. So ultimately that's the, the goal. If you can get to that clear traction metric, um, no, one, no one kind of questions that. So if I give a very simple example, um, Airbnb, their traction metric is nights booked, number of hotel nights booked per day. Um, if they can show that number going up and to the right kind of day over day or week over week, um, everyone knows the business model is doing well. You don't need much else to have that initial meeting. So you want to get, get down to that level of simplicity. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Any more? Yeah. I had a couple of things around um, social innovation and social impact type stuff. Um, <laughs> so. When we're working with uh, social enterprises or those that don't have, you know, the dollar metric or the business outcome being the thing that a lot of the focus is around um, the actual social outcomes and so forth. Um, what's the best way that you've sort of experienced that you can use your methodologies to be able to show that that approach is going to give the greatest value or long-term benefit to them? Yeah, so, so when we look at, you know, social enterprise, the first, mind shift is that you're still building a business and the goal is still to bring money in to have impact. So you are still driving for efficiencies, driving for profit, you're just reinvesting 100% of your profit into creating more value for people. Um, but the way that I like to look at that is almost like a multi-sided model. So if we look at Facebook, they have users and customers. Um, your users use the product, but they don't pay. The customers buy the data or the attention of those users and they're the advertisers. If we take that to the multi, in the not not for profit or social enterprise scenario, the people that you are creating value for are your users in the system. So you want to have some way of quantifying what that value is, what that social good is, and almost it's a derivative currency. So sometimes it's not an easy dollar conversion, but you have to go out and test. And sometimes it's even an intangible. But there are donors there who are willing for you know, reasons of giving back or reasons of attaching their brand to this cause. Um, they're willing to pay a premium for, for, for that, uh, that currency. And that's what your job becomes, is how do you measure that social impact and monetize it with your donors 
And if you can do that effectively, then you can create the cash flow you need to run run that as a business. Yeah. And so so in that, there's like a number of stakeholders in you know in any of these social causes. There's the people who have the funds up at the top, right down to the stakeholders who are actually the you know the recipients down at the bottom who are getting who are you're actually driving the campaigns for. Then delivery people all the way along. Mm -hmm. And so you driving all these value metrics that are different across all of those people. Um, would you then map that out as being multiple canvases and multiple values and then have like a, a full structure, hierarchical structure to it, <laughs> to that type of thing? Sounds, how, how would you manage that? <laughs> it sounds really complicated, but if that is if that is the nature of, 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 the, the, of the environment, then yes, absolutely. So, so even when we do like complex enterprise sales, um, you actually have to map out, you know, your decision makers, your users, and sometimes they can even be vetoed by the influencers. You may have the IT department that shuts this down because they raise an issue which even the CEO can't say we can ignore. Um, so you similarly have to figure out. But the only thing I would say there is that we sometimes like make the make the models too complex. So you want to aim for the simplest kind of touch point to make that sale happen. And so that becomes the the art of making the sale is how can I go ideally just to a decision maker and sell them on the value that I'm going to create and them say yes. But if they have to bring other people in, just how to kind of minimize the number of touch points because that's just more complexity in the in the sales process. Yeah. So your one project turns into 10. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I think we have one, yeah. Just thinking about your corporate work, like how do you, do you have any tips on how to measure um, cultural change? Cultural change within the organization yeah. with a lean context or just in as a general thing? I guess using the lean as an example, but more generally, like how the varying Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we're not really culture change. Yeah. Um, that's probably not Ash's specialty. Um, that's something we'll talk about later, maybe casually. Um, but yeah. Another question? In scaling lean, you describe a two week lean sprints. And uh, it's been left me wondering uh, how do you envision it being used in corporate environment, like two weeks sprints from project to project or from product, to product service to service. Uh, I <laughs> didn't pick up. Did you mean like sprints all the time or yeah. break them up until the success traction? Has been reached? Yeah, so, it, it, it's, so it's, it's very much what many corporates are doing already. So a lot of the lean sprint idea is essentially an extension on the agile sprint or the scrum sprint. Um, and the idea there is that it doesn't have to be two weeks. Two weeks is what a lot of I, a lot of the, the recommendation or the prescription for startups who want to go really fast. In a corporate setting, they end up being more three weeks, sometimes four week sprints. Uh, but the idea or the difference here from from why this sprint is different from a traditional um, build sprint is that in a agile or scrum sprint, you're really measuring build velocity. So you go away for two weeks or four weeks. And you come back and say, we build all the stuff and you demo it. Um, what I talk about is that that's not enough because you can build stuff that nobody wants. And so that's not progress. So you want to instead go away for if you need to add another two weeks, do that. But go away and build, measure, learn um, and come back and demonstrate traction. So come back and demonstrate the metrics that we went out um, and achieved um, or didn't achieve and use that learning to then go into the next sprint. Um, there's also an art into taking big ideas and breaking them into small experiments. So I'm also, when you go into some of those agile types of sprints, we take features and we, we measure them as small features, medium features, large features. And I'm not an advocate of that. I'm an advocate of taking everything and breaking it down into finite sprints. So everything is a two week sprint or everything is a four week sprint. And that forces action. That constraint I found creates a lot of creativity and teams go away. And instead of building a big feature, they build something smaller. Instead of going out and tackling building, they might go and do some of the acquisition stuff only. Yeah, but that's all additive, because if nobody signs up to your landing page, no one's going to download the product either. So you get a lot of faster feedback in that process. Thank you. Yeah, yeah um, you've got the two-sided marketplace, and you say you've got the two canvases for both sides. Uh, it gets a bit confusing. <laughs> Like one with an elevator pitch because you're essentially pitching two different sides of the business. How would you split that up? Or would you see someone and and so, and so who are you pitching to? 
And to, if it's just pitching your business, is that you determine the value that they're going to receive and then pitch them on that side of the business? Yeah, so so just in pitching, and the reason I ask who is that, um, it, the, the, the business model story that you tell, so Seth Godin wrote a great book, it was all marketers are liars, and then he crossed out liars and said all marketers are storytellers. And I kind of play off of that and say all entrepreneurs are storytellers too, but the stories that you're actually going to tell are going to be dependent on who you're talking to. Um, and the Lean Canvas is a great example. You can take the same canvas and highlight different boxes. So if I'm pitching this to an investor, I'm going to start, if I have traction, that is the strongest thing to lead with. So I'm going to start with traction. I'm going to say we have a marketplace and we are closing transactions you know, week over week and it's going up and to the right and I'll show them those metrics and then get into all the other things. Uh, if I'm pitching a buyer, you know, you start with their value proposition. So what are they trying to sell and why are they struggling? You talk about the problems and then you talk about um, how your solution kind of does a much better job. Um, if you're doing a seller, it's kind of same thing. So to me, it's always with respect to who you're talking to. So I'm actually not a fan of creating an elevator, like a one size fits all elevator pitch. It depends on who you're talking to. Would you say in some cases, Ash, that you may build, say, a landing page focusing on getting the supply side first, mm -hmm. building that up perhaps, and then switching it once you're ready to go after demand? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And sometimes it's even figuring out you, you have some marketplaces where it's buyer led or seller led. Yeah. And so you may actually prioritize which one to really start with. Mm -hmm. um, and again, there's a whole idea of, you know, people think of home pages and not landing pages, a very basic concept, but you don't necessarily have to have just one version of a, of a your home page is where people is, you know, your, your root domain, but a landing page is typically can be anything. So you can have a buyer landing page, a seller landing page, an investor landing page, and you just drive traffic to them based on where you're bringing them from. Yeah. And then um, you've got your pyrometrics for each one. Yeah, that's why that's that's exactly why marketplaces are hard because you have twice the work. Um, so compared to a Facebook, like a multi-sided, you can afford to work on one side. So if I was doing the next Facebook, until I get higher engagement users, I don't. That's all I need to focus in on. I don't have to even worry about advertisers and how I'm going to monetize uh, as much. I just have to focus on the user side because that is the lowest common denominator. But in a marketplace model, you have to focus on buyers and sellers. There's no way around it. You can sometimes hack one side before the other, but not for very long. You pretty much have to come up and, and do twice the work and twice the metrics. Everything is two or three times more than, than any other business model. One more question. What's the most effective way you've seen a team um, do that? So maybe the team split into two and focus on each side of the marketplace or? You can do it, but I think it's it's much better to kind of narrow scope. So, and what I mean by that is you're not when you split the team, you again create this you know game of the you know, the whispering game where people there's just silos and people may not be communicating what they're learning. So I think it's much better to rather narrow the scope of buyers and sellers. So try to go narrow on the category or narrow on the geography. So eBay today sells everything from you know, collectibles to cars, but they didn't start with everything. They started just with collectibles. And so there they realized that the way people were shopping for collectibles was very inefficient. Um, and that's one of the hacks that you want to kind of look for is that you're not trying to create a new marketplace. You're trying to remove friction from an existing one. So people would, the way they buy collectibles is hit the streets, go to garage sales and serendipitously find things and get very excited and buy them or bid for them. And so eBay came along and said, you know, we can actually find people that want to sell stuff, aggregate that, um, you know, use an auction based system. And from the comfort of your couch, you can go and start, you know, bidding for these things. You don't have to hit the streets. And that's an example of just being very focused, but really looking at buyer and seller side, going early adopter on both and connecting them. So in the beginning marketplaces don't need a lot of tech. They just need the matchmaking, the brokering ability. And you can see more and more examples of this when you start to study how those businesses went to scale. They didn't start with the solution that was scalable. They started with just kind of manual matchmaking and narrowing in scope. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Ash. You've been a great guest. Let's give it up.
Queen's Browse fan.